Hi there, I guess I'm live. I uh, have to wait for a little bit for uh, the first viewers to come in. But I plan to do like a two hour live session, uh, maybe once every week, every Thursday or so. So I'll talk slowly about uh, yeah, a range of topics here and there. I'm going to talk about, you know, gynarchy and gynocentrism, which is about uh, the fact that our societies have been organized in such a manner uh, that it supports all of women's needs at all of men's expense and doesn't really uh, doesn't really uh, doesn't really benefit men, which is the opposite of an androcentric or a patriarchal society. You know what's what's strange? They tell us who's they the feminists tell us they accuse us men of this fact that we are living in a patriarchal society where men get everything they want. Men have all the power, men have all the money. But in reality, for the past 800 years or so in Europe and by extension in North America, we have been living in a matriarchal culture, which is very, very different. Uh, somebody wants to tell me something. Yeah, go ahead. Just write. I'm going to check one more time if my live stream is working properly. Living is visible. Yeah. So it's fine. Uh, no, I don't always dress classy, dude. This is for posterity. When you, everything you record for the internet will stay on the internet. So at least, you know, a hundred years from now, people will find me. I'll look all right. Because I'm, I'm ugly enough, see? You know, when we look back at pictures from the 18th, 19th century, what do they look like? They look well-dressed. And even the, the working classes, they have like a proper shirt and a suit, right? And it, it looks so good because nowadays... Uh, men, they wear shorts and t-shirts and it makes them look like boys. And I kind of ha had enough of that. So uh, I think Jordan Peterson in this respect was very right. He said that men should dress as men, not as children. Yeah, I guess so. So uh, I prepared some things and I actually want to talk about, I want to start and finish with a slideshow uh, about the process, the psychological process growth and development process that I think men have to go through. So I'm going to try to show you my uh, here. And I got to turn off the sound for a moment. Get here. I'll show you the, the browser. Here we go. So what is the what is really the psychological process that men have to go through? Well, have you seen the movie The Lion King? So you remember that scene where Simba's father dies in the stampede, right? the little lion, the cubs, right? And Simba runs off. He leaves the pride. And this is what really happens, of course, in Africa, uh, the, the lion prides when the teenage males or when the, the males re reach uh, adolescence, puberty, they become a risk, a risk for inbreeding. You don't want... Uh, the sons of a tribe to inbreed with the females because they're related. So you drive them out. The, usually the alpha male father will expel the cubs when they are two or three years old or so. And they, the male, the male cubs are expelled, mind you. The female cubs, they can stay with the pride that they were born in. But the males are expelled. They have to leave. They have to leave to learn several things. They need to learn to uh, survive on their own. They need to become good at the hunt on their own. They have to prove that they are capable of succeeding in the hunt for several years before they, before they manage to have their own uh, lion pride. Did you know that out of every eight lion cubs that are, ex that are expelled from their pride that they were born in, only one, only one eventually manages to, uh, to rule his own pride. The other seven either die of loneliness, of disease, or so on, or of starvation. They don't make it. Imagine that. Imagine a society so Spartan. Imagine this were humans. A society so Spartan that only one in eight boys manages to have children with a woman, and the other seven die trying. That is really extreme, isn't it? I want to go through this. The rules for masculinity. One. This is the one that most people are truly shocked by, right? Uh, the, the whole idea in, um, among predatory mammals in Africa, the wolves, the lions, the, the prairie dogs, is that the male cubs, they are expelled 
from the pride. And so leaving the mother, this is the one that most people find very problematic here. So um, you have to cut loose from your mother to sever like the psychological ties that you have with her. You have to like uh, get out of uh, the dominion of your mother's womb. And I mean the psychological dominion. So psychologically speaking, a lot of men are still enmeshed with their mothers, right? And this enmeshment is uh, preventing you from becoming an independent man. And so I think in a lot of cultures like Islamic culture, Indian culture, African culture, men are born into a deeply matriarchal culture where the women rule. And uh, they have a problem with this very notion of leaving your mother. It means to become independent, right? Almost every uh, traditional tribe around the world would uh, remove the boys from the mothers at some point when they're 14, 15, 16 years old. And they tell these boys to survive on their own for at least a few weeks, right? And uh, that breaks the psychological tie with the mother's womb. When you break free from this, you are introduced into the tribe of men. You see, you see, you leave the mother's household, you stop being your mother's property, and you become uh, uh, an equal member of your father's tribe. You are introduced into the world of the father. And in, uh, in the feminist society that we are now born into, they try to prevent this process from ever even starting and basically telling you that you will have to submit and suffer under the wings of your mother and of the women in general, of the gynarchy, which is the rule of women. All right, gynar comes from vagina, gynarchy. Uh, and so they never start life. In the movie, The Lion King, Simba, at some point when after his father Mufasa has died in the stampede, Simba then uh, meets Pumba and Timon. And they represent his immature friends who are going to fill his, heads with, his head with leftist liberal nonsense. So he spends quite a lot of time with them during his uh, adolescent years, his puberty. And uh, you, can't, you can't become a real man if you are trapped by your immature friends. In many societies, actually, once a man has a, a, a girlfriend, for example, the girlfriend will often slowly, gradually try to remove you from your immature friends anyway. But it would be better for you to do it on your own accord. And so the idea of leaving your mother, meaning leaving the, the influence sphere of your mother, right? And then leaving your friends behind, your immature friends, mind you, because you're going to swap them out for something else, namely for your allies. So, so explore the world on your own, right? And then uh, this will teach you independence. Finally, this is what it's all about. You need to become so independent that uh, uh, you, you can learn to deal with hunger, with loneliness, with hardship, right? So why, why is this important? I remember watching a documentary once about a wolves in, I think, something like Yosemite Park in the USA. And there's this one wolf. He's particularly strong and he's cast out of his pack, right? He's cast out of the wolf pack. And guess what happens? He succeeds in claiming a territory of his own. By himself, he manages to defend a little territory where he succeeds at, succeeds at the hunt. He goes through hunger, loneliness, and hardship. He survives all that for a good two years. And not only does he survive, he thrives. He becomes strong and big. And you know what happens then? He returns to the wolf pack that expelled him, right? But because he has become so strong and because he has survived and has proven himself as a capable, competent wolf, the, uh, the, the females, the young females of the pack that he left, they find him very interesting now. So they sneak up on him, they investigate him, they check him out, and guess what happens? A few days later, this wolf, the lone wolf who spent so much time by himself, right? He takes several of the young females with him and leaves the wolf pack. So, so he proves himself worthy to the women. They trust his capacity, his ability. Because from the women's perspective, the young females of that wolf pack, they grew up under the 
alpha wolf, the alpha couple, really, because the alpha male has an alpha female. So they grew, grew up under the alpha couple. And uh, the alpha couple uh, suppresses and oppresses the female sexuality as well, right? Uh, the alpha couple and wolves are the only couple allowed to procreate. If the other females want to procreate, they will have to latch on to another young, strong male wolf who has proven his ability to lead the, the females. And so he succeeds in this documentary, that wolf, that particular wolf succeeds in this, takes several, three or four females with him to occupy or to populate a new territory of their own. Uh, and that's how you do it. So you have to succeed in the hunt. I just spoke about this. You got to find your allies. Now, in this, in the story I told you about the documentary, it's a soul, it's a, it's a lone wolf doing all this. But normally, as a human being, as a man, once you have separated from your mother psychologically, right, and you have separated from your immature friends, right, uh, you succeed in the hunt. You learn to hunt. You learn to get a job, for example, make money, be successful in the money, the money hunt, uh, the job hunt. <laughs> And then you find your allies, the people who are like-minded, who support you and you support them back. There's something mutual going on there. You're like an old boys network, but you're not old. All right. You hunt together because this reaps benefits. It becomes easier to hunt together. And so you can start taking down bigger prey. Maybe you start a business together or maybe you're our employees together, but you manage to do some project together, you know, whichever form or way, this is what it's all about. And so you overcome the fear of death. This is a, a consequence of you becoming independent from your mother, from your immature friends, learning to hunt together. You face your fears. You face your, your difficulties, right? And so you overcome the fear of death. Uh, this is probably, I think, I call it, this is called step nine over here, but I think this is probably the most important step in a man's psychological development. At some point in your life, you confront your fear of death itself. This is what I like about the story of Christianity. If I'm not going to repeat the Bible to you. I mean, I'm, going to, I'm not going to recite it. But why did the ancient heathen Europeans become Christians in the first place? Because in the heathen lore, they worshipped Odin, who represents sort of the god of death. And so they fear death. Every winter in Northern Europe, death comes to your door. The plants die. When the plants die, you can't feed your cattle, your goats, your sheep, your, your cows. They, they start starving. The older cows usually starve in the winter. So you slaughter them, you eat them. And you have your, your calves and your, your small goats, your, your baby animals. You have just enough food left to feed them. But what if a, if a winter is particularly long and you don't have enough feed left to feed your, your goats and your, uh, uh, your, your horses and so on, your, your foals, then they die too. And then what happens? Then you die. You start starving. So every winter, the farmers in Northern Europe would pray to Odin, please, please allow us to survive this winter. Let us see another spring. All right? Let us live through another summer. Right? Um, Christianity changes this dynamic. Christianity says, stop being afraid of death. Overcome your fear of death. And now look at what you are able to do when you are no longer afraid of death, when you are literally facing the nastiest, vilest, sickest people, such as in my comment sec section, right? And you face them, you say, hey, these people can't harm me. They are nothing to me. They are the dust underneath my feet. <laughs> they don't bother me at all. Some of them are completely psychotic, but they don't bother me, right? So you crush them because every time someone gives you negative comments, they give you insult. What is really going on here? What's the real dynamic here? They are lowering themselves. They're making themselves increasingly inferior. They become less and less and less until they become worth nothing. And you stomp on them like they are a bunch of ants, right? So that's how it goes. So after you overcome the fear of death, you still need to find your God. In the movie, The Lion King, there's this beautiful scene where Simba, now grown, right? He's almost a man. He's no longer a teenager, right? And he goes to this watering hole. I think Rafiki, the, uh, the monkey or the ape, shows him the way. And he sees him, a reflection of himself, turns into the reflection of his father. He looks up into the sky and he hears that big booming voice, Mufasa, remember who you are. Remember who you are. Remember who you are? 
meaning you're not that weak, feeble, adolescent boy anymore. You were born a king. You were born a lion. All right? This is who you really are. You must live up to who you already are anyway. You just didn't know how to be that way. But that's just, that is why there is God. You know, God, basically, a belief in God as the father, right? The male God, the patriarchal God, who guides you through life beyond the point where your, your own real father could have. Say your father died or your father wasn't a very good father. There's always God on your side. And if you believe that, that God is on your side, how can you be alone? You'll never, al you'll never be alone. And you find your mate and you rule the pride, all right? So I wanted to start with that slideshow because I'm going to talk about uh, gynocentrism, or that is the idea that society centers around women and that men exist solely to serve women. So there's a website called gynocentrism.com uh, by uh, Peter Wright and someone else. And here, I'll give you the definition that they gave. Gynocentrism refers to a dominant focus on women and women's needs and wants to and wants relative. Oh, sorry. Gynocentrism refers to a dominant focus on women's needs and wants relative to men's needs and wants. And this can happen in the context of cultural conventions, institutional policies and in gender relationships. So they explain here that this belief that like at what point in Western history did on a, on a scale, right? If say you have a, a scale that it's balanced, men on one side, women on another side, when did it happen that women all of a sudden became more important than men? Uh, it turns out that this happened about 800 years ago, in the 12th century AD in Europe. Uh, that is when the authors in Europe, the, the scribe class, began writing about romantic love about chivalry they changed chivalry <clears throat> sorry they changed chivalry the chivalric value system where how to be a hero in battle and they changed it into something else where you know it's not longer not about being a hero in battle fighting for yourself or fighting for your people no you're now fighting for the women you're you're going to be the hero for the damsel in distress and <clears throat> i didn't i didn't really understand that until recently that indeed a man who wants to be her a hero, what is he supposed to be doing? Is he supposed to be fighting the dragons to save the damsel in distress? Why are you saving that damsel in distress? Do you really like her that much? You know, are you saving her because you are required to save her? And that's a very different story, right? So I'm going to talk about that in a minute or later in the, later in the show. Um, let me re remove your. Uh, let me remove the screen here. Sorry, I removed. The, I forgot to remove the, this thing. <laughs> right. Well, okay. I'm going to answer some comments here. Uh, Vikings were not afraid of death. They didn't like dying certain ways. But yeah. So the Vikings actually, if you read the old Icelandic sagas, they um, uh, they see death as a passage to another life. So if you in the Viking imagination if you died in battle while you were healthy and strong you would be reborn as a healthy strong baby or if a rich man killed you you would be reborn as a rich child whereas if you live to old age say in your 70s and 80s and you died uh weak and frail they believed you would be reincarnated as a weak and frail sickly child so in their mind it was always better to die while you were young and healthy yeah uh, I'm going to read something. So there's a book that these authors write, Peter Wright from uh, Gynocentrism. He wrote a book uh, called Red Pill Psychology. I just want to read the first few uh, paragraphs of this book because I thought it, it is really telling. So I'm citing from the book now, okay? Uh, so years back in another life, I presented at seminars and conferences that provided continuing education units for professional recertification. This is for psychologists. In one particular module, I used a portable grease board in a room in front of my waiting audience. Without introducing myself or saying anything else, I used a grease pen to write the words 
men are dot 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 at the top of the board and then silently invited the audience to finish the sentence. Almost invariably, pigs or dogs was the first offering. Men are pigs, men are dogs, men are bad, accompanied by a room of full a room full of good natured chuckles. I would nod my head and write it down on the board and return to the audience, still silent, for more. Men are controlling, says one. Men are afraid of commitment, says another. Men are aggressive. Men are macho. Men are afraid of intimacy. Men are violent. Men are sexist. Men are power hungry. More of the pejoratives and almost only pejoratives would come from the audience till the board was full. So this audience seems to think that men are really bad, right? I then flip the board to the other side. Women are dot, dot, dot. It was a cue. And the answers were even more rapid fire than they were with men. Women are strong. Women are capable. Women are empowered. Women are sensitive. Women are nurturing. And the like would fly from the audience to the grease board like a barrage of arrows till that side too was full. What do you imagine, I would ask, taking a strategic pause for a sip of water, that these answers tell us about the real nature of sexism in the way we view men and women? So you have a grease board with two sides. On one side, people say men are bad, men are pigs, men are dogs, right? And on the other side, you say men are, uh, women are holy, women are perfect, women are great, and so on. And then you talk about institutionalized sexism. Who is really the victim here? When you basically are saying that men are good for nothing and the women are supreme beings to be worshipped, when did that happen? When did, when did that creep into our society? Well, that happened around five, 800 years ago during the Middle Ages, right? And he, he goes on, the author goes on, asking them a question with actual spoken words must have thrown them for a loop because the stock response to that question was almost invariably a room full of nonplussed, cognitively dissonant faces. People are surprised, like, what's going on here? And that confusion usually gave way to irritation, clearly at me, though every answer on both sides of that board had come from them. It is the audience that thinks men are bad, women are good. And by the way, the participants in that crowd, they weren't accountants or nurses or teachers or financial advisors. They were mental health professionals, psychotherapists, psychologists, psych psychoanalysts. They were counselors, social workers and the like. The very people we love to imagine possess the objectivity to rise above the mindset of bigotry and sexism. Yet they, the psychologists in the Western world, are the most sexist people in existence because it's them who perpetuate the myth that women are good and men are bad. And the, the author then writes, I wanted a little more pressure, so I asked more questions. How could this affect our therapeutic alliance with clients? Could it make our relationships with females enabling? Punitive with men? And always the final question I asked was, do we carry sexism against men, unconscious or conscious, into our work with each and every client? And with that question, the anger, anger usually intensified. In one talk, a female participant, a social worker, jumped out of her chair and threw her papers everywhere. You're the sexist. Yeah, right. See, the guy is a sexist because he points out that the audience is sexist, namely they hate men. Right? The psychologists hate men. Right? And so he writes, it is a telling study in the psychology of hate. Indeed, as we peel back the layers of fantasy from the profession, we are forced into a most disturbing conclusion, namely that psychology is hate. The profession of psychology hates men. If you are a man and you go to visit a psychologist expecting he will help you or support you or guide you, you could better go to church and find God because this isn't going to work. Psychologists are beta males who deeply hate you for being a man. They think that being a man is a psychological disorder, a pathology. They will describe every other man's behavior, right? Your aggression, your, your will to succeed and compete as a problem. 
or the fact that you don't talk about your feelings as much as women do, even though you as a man will probably are more likely to act on these feelings. You're trying to solve the problem rather than just talk about it, right? You're the problem. And it all comes down to, in my view, that in a feminist society ruled by women, these women want men to act and behave as women, or rather, not even as women, but as the way women would want you to behave, as the way women would want men to behave. And if you're not doing that, you must be the problem. You must be ill. You must be a man, right? <clears throat> So the Western culture is just totally broken. Uh, like I said, this idea of the damsels in distress that we men must sacrifice our lives to save women, right? it comes from that chivalric culture of the Middle Ages where uh, before that, men were apparently real men. They were strong. And they, be, they turn into the hero knight, turns into, later turns into a sort of peasant minstrel dancing and singing to the women to please them and to entertain them but never really uh, to care that much for them no i'm not polish i'm, I'm dutch this is live i'm right here uh but i'm i'm reading uh i'm reading my notes from a word document while i'm doing all the other things so uh can a house tour no you're not getting a house tour i need to care a little bit about my privacy i mean uh, eventually I'm going to get a bullet or they're going to string me up or something, right? So, um, yeah, thank you. This talk is absolutely necessary in our time, yeah. Yeah, we need to change the dynamic between men and women. Uh, rather than seeing men as providers, I think we need to see men also as conquerors who may do so for themselves, for their own accord, right? Okay, I want to switch to... a. A related topic here called uh, the new psychology of men. So, the only person I need to please is myself. Yeah, I hope you're not. I hope you don't talk about masturbation. But uh, yeah. As a human being, you can really only control your own actions, right? You are yourself trapped in your mind and body. That's all you can really do. I think Nietzsche said that you should uh, uh, pursue the will to power, makes basically to acquire the skills that you will need to make yourself most powerful. Uh, and I think that is probably very healthy, especially for a man, because you're going to become a very dominant, right? You're going to crush those weak people around you. It's not a bad thing. I read it too, yeah. No more Mr. Ni more, no more Mr. Nice Guy. Yeah, it's an excellent book. So, a new psychology for men. When they say, when I say new psychology, uh, what it really means is the feminist movement came up with a new psychology for men. Basically, they started saying that everything men think or do is a mental disorder. So, psychology, I'm going to quote something here. Psychology clings to a universal model that men are incorrigibly flawed and require a dismantling of their identities, their habits, and preferences before being reconstructed according to a feminist model of masculinity. All modern therapies have this basic premise in common. So there was a guy, uh, I think his name is Robert Levant, Robert Levant, he came up with this new psychological model of men basically telling you you're all crazy, you're all nuts, right? Uh, oh, Robert Levant was the former American Psychological Association president, and he believed that the patriarchy represents the real world. Basically, he assumes that we are living in an actual patriarchy where men have all the money and the men could do whatever they want and, and so on, right? And that men, males, are stunted in their emotional processing abilities. Basically, men aren't women because we don't, we don't talk about, uh, we don't talk about our emotions as much. That doesn't mean we don't feel them. That doesn't mean we don't have them. It doesn't mean we don't understand them. I think men are just as much in tune with their emotions and other people's emotions. It's just, it's just that our response to this is to act upon them. We want to solve things. We want to. Uh, solve the problem, basically, rather than just talk about it. I think I already said so. 
So the psychologists see men as emotionally dumb, stupid people, right? Men are like, you know, Ugh, you know, grunts living in a cave or something. And this is just nonsense. Um, I think men may have, I mean, they, they always say that women are better with words, right? I think men actually speak more. Men also write more books. So how do you say that women are better with words? I think what they mean to say is that women are better at sensing your emotional state from your spoken words. Therefore, if you deprive women of communication, if you don't talk to a woman, she is going to have trouble figuring you out. See, this is why they like the bad boys. The bad boys don't talk so much. They give her little words to rely on because women need to hear you speak in order to assess you, in order to figure you out, right? If you don't talk too much to a woman, she's going to think you're either very mysterious or emotionally dumb. <coughs> so there's a thin line between being the, the bad boy and being uh, someone they don't like. Yeah? So... Uh, there's some questions here. Uh, yeah, we express our emotions very differently, right? Uh, here, are you aware of more dominant cultures that exist today? Well, I think if you read the old Icelandic, Icelandic sagas, that was a very massively masculine dominant society. The way they, the way they, uh, the way they lived, it's just so very different from us. These men from a very early age simply quit caring about death. They were not afraid of death and that simply opened up the doors to do, you know, much more in life, you know? No, I don't. I don't speak with bitterness. Huh? So, European culture changed 800 years ago and we're not living in a patriarchal culture at all. Europe's actual patriarchal culture died 800 years ago. So we've been fooled all these centuries long, all this time. We've been fooled to believe that we are in charge as men and we owe it to women. We owe it because we wronged them. We kept them in cages and we locked them up, right? And we gave them chastity belts. And that's not true. And what happens here, partly of this is that um, during the Middle Ages, something happened to Christianity. So you have Christianity, and what they do is they introduce the cult of Mary, the mother of God, right? If you, if you change the focus of Christianity from Christ as the hero who overcomes the fear of death, who overcomes ridicule and so on, uh, and torment, right? And he uh, rises again. <clears throat> and you change the focus onto Mary as the mother of God. You're, you're literally saying there is a mother above God a female goddess, a female mother above the male patriarchal god, you're changing the focus, you're basically turning Christianity in a sort of matriarchal system. And that is what happened to Christianity during the Middle Ages, say from around the 12th century, 13th century. Um, they started focusing more on Mary, and that's when you start seeing these paintings where Mary holds the baby, baby, baby Jesus, baby Christ, whereas... Um, and, and you, you kneel before that, right? So all of a sudden, it's no longer about you overcoming the fear of death. Now it's all about uh, worshiping women, really, making women the holy goddesses, uh, and we men must submit to them and provide for them, right? Rather than seeing a woman as, as a team player on your side, she is above you and you are below her, all right? And here's where that concept of romantic love comes from. The word romantic love comes from the word Rome, from the Roman Empire. Uh, that is because the Roman-speaking people of the Roman Empire were the first to start writing about romantic love. Basically, white people invented romance. And romantic love is also, I think, related to platonic love in some way. Namely, uh, romantic love means you just want to care for her. You just want to love her, but you don't want to take too much from her because you don't want to hurt her. You don't want to make her feel bad, right? All right. I'm going to... Yeah, Christianity seems too soft, yeah. It, there, there were authors in the Middle Ages like Erasmus, Desiderius Erasmus, and others too, uh, some Dutch philosophers. I can't, I can't remember their names. But they were um, 
uh, they spoke about turning Christianity into sort of a, a, a nationalist a nationalist Christendom and more masculine Christendom that they believed was going to be necessary to fight off uh, the Ottomans who were invading Europe. This was around the early 16th century, right, when, <clears throat> when the Ottomans invaded Vienna, I think the Battle at Vienna or the Siege of Vienna. Uh, yes, it does. Romantic love was invented by the Romans during the Roman age, so romantic love for women is a white people thing. We literally invented that, and other cultures copied it much later. But yeah, th it, that's how things started, because before that, before the Romantic era, the Romance era of romantic love, uh, the relations between men and women were very different. Men were more like conquerors and much less like lovers. And so this is a big deal. Or did you conquer your woman, or did you just fall in love with her? I mean, literally, you fell to her feet. That's a very different attitude, right? And so the domestication... Okay, I want to talk about... Another related topic here. You know, this is my first live show. You know, I'm trying. I'm trying to get in, get in, get the hang of it. I want to. This is like a skill. I'm trying to learn to be uh, somebody who can fill two hours or so with a program, kind of on the fly. I did prepare some things. So I've got my notes over here. I, got, I prepared some things and some articles I want to go through. Uh, I think it's a useful skill for me if I want to continue professing my thoughts about politics, about any topic. You know, uh, you know, Pearly Things or some other of these podcasters, I like what they do or how they do it. And maybe I will go into that direction where I become more of a, a, a daily speaker or so, like a podcaster full time or so. If I could do this full time, I might start enjoying it, uh, depending on uh, depending on how much. Well, I would need to start uh, growing uh, my subscriber base. Sorry, I need a sip of water for a moment. So I'm reading from an article by Peter Wright, How to Tame Men. And I'm quoting him, Horses, dogs, and men have one thing in common. They need training in order to shed their wild ways and become civilized. Um, they need to be taught when to walk, run, sit, shit, play, work, and of course, when to cease fighting and attempt rape. Women will do this for them. Yeah, <clears throat> In our modern society, women have taken on the role of educators and nurturers, but also much more as the domesticators of men. And feminism goes a step further. Well, now that men have largely been domesticated, a lot of these men they now deem so useless because they're domesticated, they're trying to get rid of them altogether. <clears throat> I think one of the actual globalist goals may be to do to men what we do to males, male cattle. If you look at a meadow outside and you see a bunch of cows in the meadow, what do you see? Those are all females. Cows are females. The bulls are the males, but they're usually not there outside. The bulls, usually you only need one or two of them, like a, a sperm bull, right? You have one or two on stock. They inseminate all the women with the proper genes, but the females, uh, they largely live by themselves without men. Can you imagine doing this to a human population? Can you imagine that feminists would want to get rid of the male sex altogether? How would they go about doing this? Well, you could turn boys into girls until no one notices that there's no difference, right? You make the boys and girls more, tra more gender neutral, which really means to turn boys into girls, right? Because they're not, you're not going to change the girls that much. You're going to change the boys into girls. And then at some point, no one notices that the boys are gone. And then you're going to get sex-selective abortions where they abort the boys but not the girls. And then you can go one step further and prevent from boys from being conceived in the first place, maybe messing with the men's, uh, <clears throat> with the men's sperm so you filter out like genetically. Uh, prevent boys from being born. I think that would be really extreme. But I think that is, um, there's a book by Shulamith Firestone. She was a leader of the second feminist wave. And she wrote a book, The Dialectic of Sex. I think that's what it was called. And she actually wrote about this. She hated men so much. She was thinking about how to get, literally get rid of men, how to genocide men, basically, to create so so uh, societies for women only, by women only, uh, serviced by robots and a couple of uh, playboy men on stock to service women for their pleasure, but men themselves wouldn't be required anymore. 
And don't you think that is going to be the outcome of a technological society? In a technological society, you have replaced male muscle with machinery. This happened, of course, first in the countryside, where the, the mechanization of agriculture replaced the, the farm hands who were necessary to haul bales of hay around. Uh, and you replaced 20 men with one, one machine. And even though the labor may have been seasonal, you replace all these men who used to live in the countryside, who used to have their little house there, they may not, these might not have been, the, the farm hands wouldn't have owned the farm themselves, but they would have been able to live in the countryside, right? They would have had a little house surrounded by nature, some natural water stream nearby, right? They would have been able to have kids out there in the outdoors, in, in, in the natural environment. And to replace these men's labor, their muscle with machines, meant that those men had to move to the city to find a new job. This happened in the 1930s. In the German era, uh, <clears throat> uh, the men who moved to the cities because they were no longer needed in the countryside because they're because of the mechanization, they enter, they arrive at the city with no skill. They had no education. They didn't study to be accountants or lawyers or politicians or journalists or so on. They uh, they were just working class men with working class skills. But there's only that much work to do in the city. And so uh, that is how I think, in my view, the great dictator, the painter, the orator, was able to convince these surplus men, the men who were no longer needed for work, he told them, if you help me, if you support my war against Russia, against the Soviet communists, against the Bolshevik in the East, if you support me, I will allow you to have a patch of land. You will have your own farm. And I think that was ultimately the true motivation to get the German men to fight along with, with the painter's desire to conquer the East. They said, you are no longer needed uh, in the countryside, but if you fight for me, I will give you a patch of land in the East. Because that's, that's what they were trying to do, right? They were trying to uh, completely uh, strip the Slavic peoples from their lands and replace them with Germanic families. Eh? Okay, I'm going to try to answer some question here. You know, with sex selective abortions, you know what I'm thinking? I think that every every civilization has its own way of curbing the population growth. In East Asia, Southeast Asia, you used to have the killing fields, uh, but Southeast Asian women they tend to uh, until recently they would simply grab the babies and smash them to bits against a tree to get rid of them. Whereas I think. In India, they kill the girls because girls, of course, can have pregnancy. So you have more children by killing off the girls. That's the quickest way to stop a population from growing in the future. Right. But in the Western world, I think our approach is very different. And I think we know we can see how we do it. That's the circus, the LGBT circus. We castrate the boys. That's our method of population control. And then we tell the surplus girls, why don't you, you know, be lesbian? <clears throat> I'm from the Netherlands. So what's the masculinity key for Christianity? Uh, well, that is simply to overcome the fear of death. I think that is literally the most masculine thing you can do. And uh, the story of Christ is that story. It tells you to stop being afraid of social exclusion, of uh, ostracization, and overcome all these kinds of fears, your social death, but also your physical death, your emotional death. If you overcome this, all of a sudden, you are able to do so much more because nothing can stop you anymore. Uh, so, okay, I'm going to discuss a little bit about this topic of the hero as a slave. So, when we think of Hercules, right? Hercules. His real name, his Greek name was Heracles. Hera refers to the name of his stepmom, Hera, the goddess Hera, <clears throat> who was also known as the goddess of the yoke, of the yoke of animals, of horses and cattle. That's interesting. And they call Hercules, Heracles. Cles, Cles means uh, glory. So Hercules' real name, Heracles, means glory of Hera, the goddess of the yoke. 
does this sound like a hero to you? So Hera, the stepmom, she hates the fact that Hercules has become a demigod because I think they dipped him in water or something. Zeus made his son a demigod. I think that's how it went, right? So I'm not going to go into detail because I didn't, I didn't recently read the book, so I don't know exactly about the 12 works anymore. So Hercules sets out, Hercules sets out to perform um, 12 great works, right? He has to clear the stables or something. He has to uh, do other things, many other things that I forgot about. But Hercules, uh, in effect, does all these things for his stepmother, Hera. But Hera, his stepmom, she hates men. She hates Hercules. <clears throat> so this is really a story about uh, Hera represents society. Society is like your stepmom. She hates your living gods. Right. And the female society, the women ruled, women led society gets Hercules, who represents masculine energy and strength and muscle, gets the men to do the bidding of the society, because all of the great works that Hercules engages upon eventually benefit the society he was born in, uh, women's society. It doesn't really benefit himself, although at the end of the story, they make him a full god. Right. So he's a demigod. And because he succeeds in all these, <clears throat> he succeeds in all these tasks, the great works that they've laid out for him, uh, he is allowed to become a, a full god. But again, Hera doesn't like it; she still hates him. <clears throat> so the story of Hercules is not that heroic at all. He is really a slave, a domesticated male. He represents the domesticated men of society, the beta males, basically, and society just uses those men to build bridges, to clear the stables, you know, to solve problems, to solve crime, uh, all for the benefit of women. No wonder then that this story became so popular in the Western world today. Uh, and I wanted to mention something a bit, a little bit of a, a little bit radical, right? Uh, yeah, it also means glory. Kles also means glory. Uh, so did you know that uh, in Islam, the story of Muhammad was imprinted on the story of Hercules? Uh, so Hercules has Hera, his stepmom. Uh, Muhammad has, in, in the initial story, he's married to an older woman who tells him what to do. He spends uh, a long time being married to this old woman. Uh, and it's, it's imprinted on the story of Hercules. Basically, you can assume that in the Muslim world, the men have been submitted to their society. The energy of the men has been submitted to their society. And I think, you know, I always thought that the story of Christ was this meek, weak man. Why did they give us this queer, confused fellow? Why didn't they give us Hercules? But now I know why. Hercules is a slave to the goddess Hera. Whereas at least Christ in the story, he is free by overcoming his own death, he is reborn as a god, right? So, uh, here I had another remark. Uh, namely, we are now dealing with, uh, I can only say the word once because I don't know how sensitive the, uh, the TikTok censorship here is, you know. Uh, and so I'm going to say, the transgenders, those guys. Let's. I'm going to call. I'm going to call them clowns. And so the problem with uh, the clown cult is that if you don't want to date a clown, does that make you clown phobic, or is the clown perhaps normal phobic? Get it? So who's the problem here? So the clown is uh, man phobic. Get it? The clowns are man-phobic. They hate men. They fear men. A lot of these clowns have internalized a hatred for men and for being a man. So they externalize this hatred by uh, cracking down on men, saying that men shouldn't be allowed to be men. You know, they, why aren't you a feminist ally, right? And so, but you also internalize the hatred, and that's, that's why you go to see a psychologist and you... And you uh, to see a psychologist and you ask the psychologist, please, can I have my genitals removed? Because I hate myself. I hate those parts of myself. I don't want to be a man anymore. I want to be something else. I want to be something that is valued and loved. I want to be loved by my society. And if my society hates men, then I want to be a woman. 
See, that's how it goes. See, that's the true, the true logic at play here. All these men who fall for this cult, for the, for the circus, right? They are bred and raised from early ages to hate themselves because they were born the wrong gender. Not because, they, they, not because their gender is wrong, but because society at large tells them every, every day anew that they are bad. Men are bad. Men are pigs. Men are dogs. Men are worthless. Men have trouble showing emotion. Men have trouble with commitment. Men are disloyal. You can't trust men. Right? And, then, and then you have men defending that, and they say, well, well dogs are loyal. Oh, oh I, I can't stand those guys, those guys who justify being treated so poorly. You deserve to be treated a lot better than society treats us nowadays. Men are fucking awesome, right? We have the right to fight, conquer, and explore, right? To see a good chunk of the world, to experience it, to experience life, to not have to be afraid of what lies around the corner, but to, to not to be afraid of death, but to, to chase, to race towards it, right? Imagine death were a wall. I had this dream once where death was a wall and we're all in little cars moving toward that wall. But most guys are so afraid of the wall, they have their foot on the brake the whole time. See, they're weak, they're cowardly. They have no, no, no strength, right? So they have their foot on the brake and they live life in a very slow, uninteresting pace. They live a long life. They make it to 80 years, 90 years, 100 years, 110 years. And then when they hit the wall, they die anyway, right? But their lives were boring. Now imagine you can life, live life differently in this scenario. So in my dream, I have my foot on the gas pedal and I'm accelerating the whole time because I'm thinking to myself, I'm gonna move that wall, get it? I'm going to race my car so hard. I'm going to slam my car into that wall with such a force. I'm going to move that wall. Death is going to have to step aside for me. So I dream about things like that. Yeah. And I think all men should, should listen to this kind of wisdom. You should listen to these words. Don't be afraid of death. Death is a wall, but you're going to move it. Death is going to have to step aside for you when you come, come for it. Right? That's how I see it. I, as you can tell, you know, when I become more passionate about something, I think all men have this strong energy in themselves to be so much more than we are told to be the nine to five or the Monday to Friday or, you know, have your Friday evening drinks with the colleagues and it's all about, well, <laughs> how have you been this week? And did you finish your project? <laughs> uh. You know, we should be warriors. We are warriors and conquerors, and we, are, we should be fearless men looking to achieve boundless uh, activities, boundless act, fearless men and boundless action. That's what it's all about. I got to take a sip. Yeah, I like this comment. We shouldn't be living in an office looking for spread, looking at spreadsheets. Yeah, it's even worse than that. You know, have you ever worked for a big corporation? It's usually the interns looking at the spreadsheets, and the managers they just copied or what they just they just do literally whatever the whatever the interns came up with. Uh, so. I'm going to play a pre-recorded video that I recorded several years ago already. Uh, please forgive me so I can have a little, uh, a little break from talking. It's just 20 minutes or so. And you're going to listen to me talk about the matriarchy, about what the, basically what, when, when you hear people talk about the new world order, that's the matriarchy where they definitively put women in charge of the Western world, right? So I'm going to see if it, if I open the video. Okay, so I'm going to start the video. It's just 20 minutes, and then I'll come back to talk some more. We at this point have a legitimate question to ask. What is the New World Order? Now, many of us will think it's about uh, some geopolitical reality that the United States wants to stay top dog in the global economies and uh, basically make China its labor force. The Chinese are not willing to cooperate Neither are the Russians, there are other nations, Iran, for example, 
and many others who don't want to cooperate with the American worldview. But if you thought it was about geopolitics alone, and you're, you'd be mistaken, the new world order, the word new says it's something very different than the old. What was the old world order? Well, uh, I'll tell you that building the new world order is about uh, phasing out the patriarchy, meaning the rule of men over the world, and replacing it with a, a sort of globalist matriarchy or the rule of women over the world. The new world order is about a complete transformation of the human species as we've known it. It is a movement pushed not just by uh, economics or corporate leaders, but primarily by the feminist movement. It is the women, the feminist women, who want to transform the old world order, which they think is the patriarchy or nations ruled by men, and transform those nations into a globalist world government ruled by women, a matriarchy or sometimes also called a gynarchy, the rule by vaginas. Now, before I continue, I want to read something to you. Uh, it was published in 2011, uh, written by Russell Means, a researcher who published this in the 20th volume of the third issue uh, of Griffith Law Review, titled Patriarchy, the Ultimate Conspiracy, Matriarchy, the Ultimate Solution. Ultimate Solution, it begins in the title. The word ultimate solution refers to the final solution. It's as though they're hinting at something that they want to put an end or genocide the patriarchy or perhaps men. Now, let me read this to you. These last 6,000 years, since the beginning of time, according to the Bible, are a convenient lie. From religion to governments, we have lived under a patriarchy with the leaders at the top of the proverbial pyramid and the rest of us underneath. This is a fact of life on our overpopulated earth. What is a patriarchy, though? It is a system that both completely lacks and completely fears the feminine. Patriarchy is an imbalanced, fear-based, warlike, and truly insane structure because only a patriarchy is on top, obsessed with control and completely inhumane to everything below. What it fears, it wants to control. What it can't control, it wants to terrorize and destroy. Within this strict system, there is no true freedom. What then is the solution to this problem? The answer is to simply return to a matriarchy based on the feminine. A matriarchy actually represents the origins of individual liberty through representative government. Wow. This, however, is not some uh, weird guy writing some strange things in some uh, unknown uh, law review magazine. No, this is what the feminist left actually want to achieve. As they say, they, they believe that matriarchy, the rule by women, is the only way, basically they're saying it's the only way to have democracy if it is led by women. They say that men who form patriarchies when they work together and they rule over nations and peoples, they say that those men are just driven by fear and hatred and they just want to crush and oppress, oppress everything below them. Uh, and I feel that this text is completely insane, but it happens to be so that the people who believe in this text, and this includes men, the, the feminist helper males who want to help feminists establish a global matriarchy, um, they really believe this and they really want to build this. This comes as quite a shock to me to read this, that this is how uh, uh, deeply rooted the hatred of the feminist left is not just for male um, political structures, they call it patriarchy, or men themselves, it seems. It seems they hate men 
And I find it so shocking because in my mind, uh, there was never such a thing as a patriarchy where men ruled over the world. It was only so that the men sacrificed their time and their resources to give the world that leadership in order to provide for women and families and children, in order to build societies, to build and maintain cities, uh, to keep the economy going. Uh, it was never a case of uh, merely crushing women and making them fear us. This is insane. How can you even claim something like that? I always perceived the world for a long time at least, I perceived the world as men and women basically being different, but still working together so that our differences come together in a family where we raise children together. So a woman can be more of a nurturer to the child and understand the child's emotions and its psychology better than maybe men do, because men's minds are more tailored toward uh, working in the economy, perhaps a bit more technical, a bit more... Uh, oriented in the geography, as in the hunters who have to go out and hunt things. Men still often drive to work, whereas a lot of women stay at home to raise the kids, uh, the homemaker, mothers. And I never saw any wrongdoing in, in this, in any of this. I thought men and women uh, bring their assets together in order to have children. But according to the feminist radicals, uh, apparently men have been uh, all but good for the world, merely to put themselves in power for what? For the sake of uh, laughing at the beings that we ridicule and crush each day? This is insane. It's not true. New world order then means the transition from uh, a world where men lead, where men can be politicians, where men can be the CEOs or the presidents or the directors of all sorts of organizations, and basically getting rid of these men. And in our time, particularly white men, to be replaced by women and minorities. Now, of course, the feminist movement has to get white women on board. If they wouldn't, right, it's a way, it's a way to blackmail you, right? It's to blackmail white women to please side with the minority males and the minority women and everybody else who claims to be oppressed m merely in order to somehow sheepishly uh, move in the matriarchy that will see the end of all men from every place on earth, including Africa and India and so on. So I believe there, that this movement, the feminist radical movement, is only using minorities as long as they serve a purpose, for example, in terms of the vote. If you can have a majority minority vote against the minority majority, if you get if you get what I mean, then the minority majority will lose, meaning the white middle class will lose all power. And then supposedly all the problems in the world will be solved. Of course not. Of course not. This notion that men would, white men would only be in it for themselves to give themselves power over other people. Uh, to me, it's an absurd notion. It is so far removed from my reality. Uh, I've actually perceived the opposite. I've seen a lot of women in our time who've become overly materialistic and uh, overly selfish, individualistic, single mothers, women who don't want to live with men anymore. And I believe that is actually a function of our materialistic time where basically we stop caring about uh, the, the well-being of our soul, our spirit, and our mind, and we only care about the stuff we have. And I think it's funny that um, one radical feminist said this sometime on Twitter. She said uh, she believed that men are more materialistic than women, and I don't believe that. Her arguments were that, well, men care more about cars than about their children. Um, I actually think men only buy cars because they think they have to in order to attract a female. So uh, guys get a car thinking they'll get a girl. Girls get a guy thinking that they'll get a car. There's not a way, not a nice thing to say, but I think there's a lot of truth in it that uh, it's actually the female sex that is the more materialistic one. Because if men could just get the love that they wanted from women, 
they wouldn't build houses, they wouldn't go to work, <laughs> they wouldn't buy cars, they wouldn't, they would just feel in love all day. But a lot of men nowadays feel inadequate. We feel not good enough for women. Uh, we feel that the women uh, put such high demands on us that if we cannot give them a Rolex every time it's their birthday, or we cannot give them uh, a third car or buy them a bigger house, then we're not good enough. So it always comes down, for us as men, it comes down to this financial equation. Can we afford to be in love or are we going to lose everything? So, and so it goes for that accusation that the patriarchy would be some kind of a warlike system that just likes to wage war for no reason. But of course, the men go to work for the same reason, same reason the men go to war. It's to acquire resources, assets that provide a cash flow for the women left at home. And the reason I, I put it in this way that I think women are more materialistic is I've seen that in our society everywhere that women now take on leadership roles in the top echelons of our society. Say, for example, in the Netherlands, the director of our national uh, soccer club organization, the KNVB, is a woman. Um, I get the impression that they're, they're in it just for themselves, that they have their own strong ideological uh, uh, motivations, for example, to push Black Lives Matters onto the Dutch soccer team to try to get them to kneel. They refused, so it didn't happen. But and to push diversity to make sure that we have a lot of African players in in uh, all Western European soccer teams. Um, these are these are the ideals of the um, Marxist, globalist, universalist, feminist left that have. Uh, little support from the people, actually. A lot of people, they shrug their shoulders because they don't care, but the people who do care, they find it odd that everything now is politicized, everything is ideologized, and this comes down to some very important differences between men and women. Uh, women tend to subscribe to a consensus the women's consensus in the in the female hierarchies there is a sort of agreement of what is or isn't true even if this belief is at odds with observable reality whereas men would mm, pay more attention to the observable reality and say well i've seen this i've heard that this is so so they pay more attention to their own individual senses but that means they can still be wrong if they misinterpret their observation. So I'm not saying that one mode is better than the other. I'm saying that there is this important difference is the reason why men and women find it so hard to understand each other. For example, uh, a male leader would always make sure to provide for his people. He would not see himself as an atomized individual, but rather tied or bound to the laws of his land or of his people to make sure that they survive and he's probably likely, say, like the captain of a ship, to be willing to be the last person saved. So first everyone else gets off the ship before he abandons ship. Whereas with female leadership, I have noticed that it is a battle for um, uh, importancy. It's about them now. It's no longer about the group that they're a part of because they don't see themselves as part of any group. Women have hierarchies, but they, they, they see themselves as a, a global collective of individuals, whereas men often see themselves as a member of a group or a team or a nation or a tribe or a race. The real problematic matter here is if you transition from this old order, which they think is the patriarchy, toward the new order, which they think is the matriarchy, is what are radical feminists going to do to our boys? You see, they give birth to the boys. What are they going to do to them? And you can see what they're going to do to them simply by paying attention to the culture. We have a culture of the uh, LGB circus. So I'll call it the circus. Uh, the circus is pushed on two boys basically to make sure to, that they they are prevented of be prevented from becoming actual men so that it is almost certain they will not have power and that they will grow up as men subordinate to women it's about subordinating the male sex but women have greater control over men for example women could swallow pills or take jabs to prevent 
themselves from even giving birth to boys. And I believe that is possible. You can inject hormones into a woman's body that somehow prevent, it, uh, prevent boys from being conceived in the first place. Uh, secondly, uh, women can have sex-selective abortions. They can abort their boys and keep the girls. In a matriarchal society, those become the tools to decide how many men are allowed to exist in the world. So they will keep uh, the slaves, right? They will keep servants and the occasional alpha male who is allowed to breed with them for fun, right? But they will not uh, care about equality. And that's my point. Uh, even if from women say that there was no equality in the past, uh, they, are, they don't actually care about equality in the future. They care about the reversal of what they perceive as unequal. And if we look at the Western world now, and we look at the Eastern world, by Eastern world, I mean Russia, China, probably perhaps India, the Western world, that will be uh, Africa, Europe, and North America and Latin America. If you see what's going on here, you see a very strong uh, female leadership rising in the West, whereas in the East, the Chinese Communist Party is all male. They don't have diversity either. They are their own nation. And it looks as though, even though China, most famous for its communist leap forward, the great leap ahead, uh, the communist revolution, the socialist revolution under Mao Zedong, China today is what they would call basically a nationalist system under a czar, the president, no longer an emperor perhaps, but in, in theory, in terms of the power that the president of China yields, is the power of a czar. So you see the world is now divided in a female half, which is the West, and in a manly masculine half, half which is the East. Uh, this is the reason why NATO will go to war with Russia. Because once you crush Russia, then you can attack China from two fronts. From the, Then Europeans could attack China, whereas uh, American armies could attack China from the East and the Europeans from the West. And so you could then finally put China down, so to say, but the main motivation for this is not just economical. The main motivation for it uh, to send Western men to war against China and Russia is to destroy the perceived patriarchies in those countries, uh, as well as in India, and to make those countries accept diversity, inclusion, uh, equality, and ma mainly the matriarchy and to install women in power in, in that part of the world as well, in order to create a single giant communist globalist ginarchy, the rule of women over the whole world where men are demoted uh, to the role of servant and pleasure models. I won't be a part of such a thing. I won't be a part of a matriarchal world. I will seek higher ground and somewhere live on with the few remaining women who also wish to escape the system because of course it's not true that all women support feminism. Most women don't. Most women are not aware of uh, radical feminist intentions, namely to deconstruct the family, to remove men from families, to remove men from power, to remove men from society. Most women don't want this, uh, but they are voting for it. Whenever people, men and women, vote for leftish parties, uh, political parties, they are actually voting for the destruction, the deconstruction of the male sex altogether. I mean, the whole circus is there uh, to make men uh, disappear. See, if you dress boys up as girls, and all the boys start looking like girls, and then you start doing sex-selective abortions, no one will notice that the boys have disappeared all of a sudden. And it may be that that's what they're aiming for. And that means uh, the very small minority of Western men willing to go at it alone with, uh, with supporting women, of course. We're going at it alone, meaning separating ourselves from this society, cutting loose from these bizarre feminist matriarchal structures, and somehow somewhere in the woods or on the mountaintops found new nations of our own. We're going to have to start really small and we're going to have to make alliances with, say, the peoples in the East who are still patriarchal, uh, Russians, Chinese people, Indian people. We're going to have to make alliances with them and somehow 
lead the revolt, lead the pushback, the blowback against this feminized, feminine, feminist thing that is that is blowing over the West. And perhaps if we do find our allies, we can put a stop to it. Hi, welcome back. You were, uh, if you're new here, you were watching a 20 minute clip that I recorded years ago. I noticed that uh, my speaking has improved uh, since. And uh, <clears throat> I think I want to wrap it up a little bit. I want to show you the slideshow again that I started with uh, over here. Right. <clears throat> so I showed you the slideshow at the start. 12 Rules for Masculinity. It's a play of words on uh, 12 Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson, who doesn't really tell you how to be a man. He tells you how to clean your room, which is a cleaner's job. You don't want to be a cleaner. You want to be a warrior. You want to be a conqueror. So step one, this is the one people hate me most for. Uh, when you say leave the mother, it means psychologically you have to leave your mother's womb when you are born. Then you leave the mother's house to go and see what, what is daddy doing in the barn or in the tool shed or outside. So you go to the father, you leave the mother, and you are introduced in the world of men. You follow the road, the path of the father, right? Which also implies you have to leave your immature friends behind. Not everybody has immature friends, right? But you know what I mean. Pumba and Simone, Timon from, uh, from, the, from the Lion King, they are immature, and eventually they also have to shape up. But you might be the first, so why don't you just leave them and be the leader? Uh, oh, what? Here. Uh, then go out there, explore the world on your own. Don't be afraid of it. Feel confident doing things by yourself, traveling across the world, for example. Figure things out, meet new people, right? But then you're also, you're also going to have to deal with the negative sides of life. Hunger, loneliness, hardship, or any kind of trouble you might get yourself in. Overcome it because it's a skill. Learning to deal with the bad stuff out there in the world is a skill you acquire and you carry it with you for the rest of your life. So then succeed in the hunt, make a lot of money, get a good job, whatever, right? But succeed in it. Find your allies, right? Hunt together. Hunt together for prey that makes hunting easier. You'll have better, greater benefits. Maybe you can be the leader of the pack and you'll have very great benefits. Right? And then learn to take down bigger prey, do more important things for yourself, right? And then overcome the fear of death. I already spoke about this at length, so I'm not going to repeat that. Overcome the fear of death. I think this is the most important step in a man's life. Men simply overcome the fear of death. Find your God, right? Find your mate. And then you can settle down and rule the pride as a vicious warrior leader. Why? Because you've acquired all the skills and the experience necessary to be the ruler of your pride. Uh, and then there's another one here. There's another slideshow here that says the Spartans, they actually removed their boys from their mothers at age eight. And then the boys were forced. They didn't have a free choice, but they were forced to go into the Agogi, which was a warrior training program for 13 years from age 8 to 21, learning how to be a warrior soldier. And then when they come back, they go to war. All right? and, they, uh, and then there's, uh, there's a lot of people, a lot of grown men, who in my view prove my point there's something deeply wrong with our society. We are living in a matriarchal society where boys are raised to be the servants of their mothers, and then this happens. Now, I'm taking care of my mom forever. I'm not leaving my mom. <laughs> Do not leave your mother. Never leave your mother. You know, now, nah, dude, take care of your mom till death. <laughs> Leaving your mom has to be the worst decision you can make. Actually, you have to leave the, the dominion of your mother, leave your mother's household, and become a member of the male tribe, right? I won't leave my mom when she's still alive. She took care of me and I will do the same. That's not your job. It's your mother's job to take care of you to the point where you become independent. And then you start, you venture out, as I showed you before. You become independent. You succeed at the hunt. You overcome the fear of death. You find your God. And then you start your own family, right? Leave the mother? What a Western thing to do. Maybe that's why most of you are into the rainbows. No, dude. Maybe that's why most of the people in your culture hold hands. Right? And wear dresses and carry a purse around. Come on, desert people. So, 
uh, I didn't have too much more to say. Uh, I wanted to fill two hours. I think I made it to one hour, 20 minutes. Okay, I'm going to get better at this. This is my first real live show. I'm trying to trying to make it interesting. You know, I, I like the idea of becoming something like uh, pearly things or something. I don't want to be a woman, but I want to have a show like that. Maybe I'll like it. It's a it's a growth process for me. I need to learn how to speak better. I need to have interesting things to say and to do to keep you interested. I need to grow my subscriber base. So I, I thank everybody who was watching. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm just going to say goodbye now. Though, man.